think sometimes you go through the circumstances of a day and you think, wow, there's a plan B, but you realize and all along that God really had a plan A. And long before we knew that there were going to be changes, that God had ordained this particular moment for us to be able to do something very different that I think is going to be life-changing, not just for the people in this room, but I really believe life-changing for those even outside of this room that we were to pray uh, God will impact through this particular morning. We found out uh, just through the grapevine that one of our own um, uh, students, Zizi, was having her brother come visit her. And, um, and when we found out about uh, the fact that Zizi was having a bit of a family reunion here in Lynchburg, um, we knew that her brother was going to be with us in town already. Uh, her brother happens to be uh, globally known as a pastor who for years and years spent time in prison in Iran as a man who would simply not bow down, all right, or give up his faith uh, in an effort to be released from prison. Pastor Saeed Abedini has for years and years been for us an example, right, uh, a testimony of what it looks like where in a world that we live in that's hostile so many times to our faith, people find themselves on the receiving end of, of this very reality called persecution. Today there are 160,000 people. 160,000 people, our brothers and our sisters in Christ, who are the persecuted church who will be martyred for their faith in this very moment. Literally thousands and thousands of brothers and sisters, just like Pastor Saeed, are in prison today. He's been released, but, but there are people just like him who have not been released. Uh, in, in the continent of, um, uh, I just got this for you, in, in North Korea alone, 70,000, 70,000 brothers and sisters are in prison right now, today, because of their faith. And so um, I think he, he's a voice for them, but he's also just a voice for um, just what it looks like to be flawed, but at the same time in your life, certainly not perfect, but at the same time you know, just passionate about God, and, and to walk into a place where all you're doing is doing what God called you, and then you see that a part of that is that you go through persecution. We, we found out that Pastor Saeed was going to be released out of prison about a, a month and a half ago. We all saw that on you know, global news, and, and we immediately wanted to have him come speak here, but he wisely decided that um, he was going to take a break from speaking, he was going to really take a time uh, to, to get his footings back, to, as he was released from prison, go work on his marriage, go work on his, you know, just being around his kids again, and, and just to gather his thoughts after years and years of imprisonment. And so we wanted to respect that, but we found out yesterday he was in town. And um, we're not having him speak today. We just thought, since he's here, why don't we do what we sometimes do when we have people that come into our space and just pray for him? You know how we always, when we do interviews, uh, ask that very last question that we think is the most important? You know that question, right? We always ask different questions, and then our last question is, how can we pray for you? This is really today. Today we're not really having um, a, a time where a man's going to come and speak. We, we have a brother in Christ who happens to be in town. And um, we just really have one question, it'll have a, a few parts to that question just so we can know what's going on and how we can pray for him. And so it'll feel a little bit like an interview, but there's really one question with a part A, B, and C in that we want him to tell you, for some of you who don't know, who he is, what he's been through, how God used him, and then, most importantly, uh, how we can come alongside of our brother right, and his family in this particular moment. And we want to think beyond him and who he represents today, again, uh, our brothers and sisters all around the world who are being persecuted. And so we're going to spend a few minutes with him, getting really one big prayer request. We're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for his family. And then we're going to pray for the persecuted church. We're going to pray for the work of the gospel, not just in this city, not just in this state, not just in America. But we're going to pray for awakening and revival throughout the, the edges of the world, including the 1040 window, right? And so we're going to get to do that today. And so let's just, uh, just kind of embrace this moment, right? And thank the Lord and His sovereignty that uh, even though we thought Sammy was going to be the one, that really uh, we're going to get to spend a few minutes with Pastor Saeed and, and grabbing one big fat, you know, prayer request from him. We do want to show you a little bit of video. His um, wife, Nakma, was with us actually a few years ago when he was in prison, pleading with us to come alongside of them in prayer. Uh, there's some video in that. There's some video of uh, President Obama at the National Prayer Breakfast uh, talking about Pastor Saeed uh, and some newsreels. We're going to show that to you, and then we'll spend a few minutes with this, um, this brother in Christ, and then we'll spend a, a good bit of time on the end uh, going after God together, all right? on bended knee. Let's watch this together.
Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, as you know, my husband, Saeed Abedini, is serving an eight-year sentence in Iran's um, notorious Evan prison, which is one of the worst prisons actually in the world. He's been asked and uh, tortured to deny his Christian faith and return to Islam. Last year, we prayed together for Pastor Saeed Abedini. Our country has not forgotten Brother Saeed. We're doing everything we can to bring him home. Then I received an extraordinary letter from Pastor Abedini. And Pastor Abedini wrote, nothing is more valuable to the body of Christ than to see how the Lord is in control and moves ahead of countries and leadership through united prayer. He stood strong in that prison. He's led many, many, over 30 people to Christ in that prison. The kids and I desperately want him back, but we're proud that over us, he's chosen Christ. Even over coming back to us, he's chosen to stand up for his faith, and not only stand up for his faith, but to proclaim the gospel in that dark prison. And he closed his letter by describing himself as prisoner for Christ, who is proud to be part of this great nation, the United States of America, that cares for religious freedom around the world. Pastor Abedini, who has been held in Iran since 2012, has been released. There was an enormous push on Congress and the White House to act on his behalf. It's taken an awful long time, but this morning it looks like this Christian pastor, you're seeing him right there, Pastor Abedini, has been released from custody in Iran. Welcome home. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Liberty University, and I'm so thankful that you have me here. And uh, as a witness of the strength of power of the prey, we can see that no government, no official, no power can stop the power of the prey of church. So today I stand. Yeah. Yep. Today I'm here to, as a witness, to show the power of pray and send a message to governments such as gov Iran government, North Korea, and China. We can send them a message that they can do anything with the churches, and persecuted churches are alive, and nothing can put them down, and the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the churches. And uh, every time that they push us back, church arise, get united, and we see the glory of God in it. Thank you, and God bless you. Amen. Pastor Saeed, uh, I think we would love to hear, if we could just go back, how you became a believer, you know, there in, in an unlikely place like Iran. Uh, how did you come to Christ? How did your family come to Christ? Um, can you give us a little bit of your story? Sure. Uh, I grew up in a very strong Muslim family. Actually, my mom, Bibi, she, she is relative to Prophet Muhammad. So uh, I always been a very strong Muslim. When I was 14 years old, you know, I signed up in Hezbollah group to attack Israel. So I always been in pray, namaz, and fasting, reading Quran, and I always want to be a very good, you know, strong Muslim and please God. Uh, but to be honest with you guys, uh, every time that I tried and tried, I didn't have eternal peace in my heart. And I tried to kill myself. I got a bad depression. And when I was just 20 years old, I just tried to kill myself. And in that time, I 
went to a church in Iran, Assemblies of God Church, was a legal church there, and they just actually, they shut it down, the government shut it down six months after I got arrested. And the pastor told me, Jesus is Lord. And I was like, what? Jesus is not Lord, Jesus is a prophet. And uh, so I made a decision to kill that pastor before I kill myself. And the same night, when I was just going from the church, walking all the way to the house, to my parents' house, and uh, I was very confused. I saw that uh, Muslim believes that Islam is the most completest religion in the world, but why I don't have peace in my heart? And the Christian, they said, Jesus is Lord. They made a human as a Lord and worship him, which I can't accept that. So I was very confused, very uh, sad about, you know, the situation that I'm in it. And the whole way, I was just crying, walking to my parents' house. And when I arrived to my room, I remember as the first time, I just knee down and uh, started like a normal prayer, not like namaz. And I got Bible in one of my hand, Quran in the other hands. And I just knee down and start crying. Lord, please show me which one is true. I'm confused. Both of them, they said, we are true. And both of them has like millions, billions people followers. And I'm just 20 years old, you know, and I don't know the reality of you. Just show me. And I was very tired and I slept. And the same night after I slept, a voice woke me up and called my name. Say, say, I'm coming back soon. Go to preach my gospel. And I woke up, looked around. No one was in the room. And I was, went to sleep again. And two hours after that, the voice woke me up again, said, I'm coming back soon, go to preach my gospel. I woke up and I said, I got psycho, you know, I, I need to go to psychiatric. <laughs> so I made a decision, tomorrow I go to the psychiatric. So, and then I went back to sleep. But the third time, I heard a huge voice woke me up and shake the walls. And uh, I woke up, it was like a bomb shaking the walls. And I woke up, and a voice very strong said to me, Said, I'm coming back soon. Go to preach my gospel. And I saw a huge light in the room that I couldn't see inside the light. And my, my body was shaking. My T-shirt in a second just get wet. And uh, I was so scared. And as the first time in my life, I felt the strong, heavy presence of Lord that I couldn't handle that. So I just want to escape from that prison. I couldn't handle it. I said, amen. And then when I said amen, I could look at the light, and I saw Jesus went to the, uh, uh, the mountain was in front of my room window, which every prison was under it. I went there as a prisoner for Christ's letter, and I fell down like a dead person, and I went back to sleep. And the day after that, I was someone else. There was no hate in my life. And it was very clear how God in a human in, can be in one flesh, in one person as Jesus Christ, as the Lord and Savior. So all of my question was answered. So I turned to Christ. Wow, praise God. So Pastor Said, that, that's how God saved you, but uh, you just mentioned the prison that you spent years in. How did you end up in prison? So after your conversion, how, how did that calling on your life uh, play out? The day after I got that command from our Lord, I just started obeying Him. I never went to Bible school, and uh, actually until that time, I never read my Bible. So I just went to street, to parks, universities, and started sharing gospel with everyone that I saw. And nothing happened. <laughs> no one believed me. I've been threatened, I've been beaten, and no fruit. So I just came back to pray, Lord, you told me to go, but no one believed me. This is a Muslim country. You know, they believe they have everything. They knew you. So, and just Holy Spirit put my heart, don't give up, keep continue. So I just obey, went to the street, talked to people, and after months I saw two, three people turn to Christ. So we got a very small church, gathered together, start Bible studying, 
and actually we didn't have a place. My, par my dad, if he found that I became Christian, he just kicked me out from house. Now he's here, he's Christian. And yeah, <laughs> give him glory. <laughs> So I, I remember I just put my Bible under my t-shirt that he doesn't see that I'm going to pray. He doesn't see that I'm reading Bible. And then we went to a park and start praying for a year till 12 at the night to like 7 in the morning that God's kingdom come to Iran. We have just like four or five young people, no future actually, no university, no money, no place to gather, nothing. But I just... Remember that verse, that verse in Bible said, seek the kingdom of God and all will be added to you. So we just make a decision together. We are in the hardest country for God, preaching the gospel. We don't have anything. We have been not connected with so many churches there. We were just alone. But we said, we're going to put God first. We trust in that verse. This is a promise of God. Amen. And if we just work on it, I believe God's going to bring the result and fruit. So for a year, till 12 at the night to 7 in the morning, we just start praying in the park. Goodness. In winter, in spring, in summer, and just we continue praying and praying hours each night. And then I saw the churches was just exploding, increasing. Five turned to 50, 500, 5,000, and now no one can number it. When I was in prison, I had the chance to go to the private hospital. And so I could see some of the Iranian people that they came and they recognized me because my story was in Voice of America, Persia, a lot in Iran. And then when we start talking and then I found that they know me. And then when we start, continue talking with each other and I found our Christian. And then when we start continuing and continuing my talking with them, I found that that they have been in my churches as a, like a four or five generation after I left Iran. So it's just all over Iran. So I start 30, uh, 100 house churches in 30 cities. And as the church was increasing, I got problem with Iran government. So they arrested me. They took me to prison and court so many times. This time that I've been arrested was the 10th time that I got arrested. And uh, so the story of God, preaching, prison, preaching, prison was starting in my life. Over a hundred churches he planted. Yes. When, uh, when I first heard of you, it was actually, the accusation was that uh, you had actually started a Christian school. And uh, so not just Christian churches that you were planting, but you were beginning Christian education as well. And you would go in prison, get out, go in. So, and then obviously, then all of a sudden you were there for, you had an eight year sentence, right? And can right. you tell us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. uh, the first time that they arrested me, they tried to put pressure on me to deny my faith. That was maybe 14, 13 years ago. And then after torturing me psychologically and, you know, putting me to jail, they saw it doesn't work. So that's the power of faith. You can see that Satan goes step back when you stand firm in your faith. And then when they saw it doesn't work, And when they saw it doesn't work, they start just stopping everything that I'm starting. You know, I start just uh, training pastor leaders for the house churches. So they told me, okay, now you are Christian. For us, you are dead. You never be saved. You never go to heaven. You killed your soul. And we can't change you. They declare that, you know. But just don't change this Muslim to Christianity. Don't, they always use the word of kill. Don't kill them, you know and uh, just stop everything that you are doing. And I said, no, that's my calling. These people need to be equipped, need to be fit. So uh, the conflict between us became, you know, uh, more stronger and stronger. And then when they saw it doesn't work, uh, they put a new charge on me by saying that you want to change the Muslim to, Christian, to Christianity by the plan of removing the Iran government. So they add a political sentence on my case to stop me because legally in their parliaments, it's illegal to stop any religious activity. Everyone is free. You know, we have two different kind of law in Iran. One law is just supporting with mullahs. The other law is just uh, supporting with parliaments. 
and the parliament said that you can't evangelize, you can't change your uh, religion, but the mullahs, they, they believe this is uh, seen and they, they said you were a threat it. to the state, right. basically. And they said, you had a plan to remove government. And I said, I didn't want to do that. I'm just, you know, trying to help these people and, you know, get this uh, eternal sal salvation. And they said, no. If these people now turn into 1,000, 100,000, and 1,000, they knew all the numbers, you know, they're very actually active, intelligent police of Iran. And they said if they turn to a million, they're going to vote to have a Christian leader. And when they're going to vote to have a Christian leader, so we can be in charge. They don't want to have an Islamic Republic government of Iran. So they're going to remove the government. And I said, OK, wait until that time that turned to millions. But now it's just 1,000 people. I said, no, you know, we, we don't wait until that time. We should just kill it right now. When it's the seed, it's just growing. So uh, that was the reason that they took me uh, to prison this time and uh, put eight year sentence for me. That's when we began to really hear your story more nationally. And uh, I remember just hearing that they would move you from prison to prison simply because everywhere you were going, you were uh, converting those who were prisoners with you. You were converting the, the, the prison guards. Um, I think when Natma was here with us, uh, if you watched Natma's old video when she was here, she said, so far we know of over 30 people that my husband has mm -hmm. led to the Lord. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, how God used you while you were there. I'm, I'm actually very proud of our God. You know, I love Him, the way that He moves. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yep. And the way that He is faithful. Doesn't matter what circumstances, what situation you go there, always your faith to Jesus Christ in the darkest place really works and bring light in every darkness. Now I'm here as a witness, not as a, I'm a good Christian or I'm a good pastor, I'm nothing. But as a person that I saw how God was moving there and standing as a witness that no government, no official, no power can stop what God started in us. And uh, so everywhere that I went, actually I'm not a very brave person, you know. Uh, when I had the interview with Fox News, they told me, you are very brave, I'm not. Actually, I'm a very fearful person. And because I'm a very fearful person, I'm always sticking to the feet of Jesus. Just yeah. don't let me be alone here. Because if you want to be a realistic, there it's very dark. These people are very harsh. They really hate us. They really hate Christians. They really hate America. And they do everything that they can do to stop us. That's the reality. But our Lord is above all these things. And when you just got, come on your knees, you can see He's there. You can see He opened the doors and He opened the hearts of the people. I remember the last hours that I was there, my interrogator that he tortured me for three years came. I, my, my eyes had a band, I had a band eye just two hours before we go to the plane, come out from Iran. So I heard his voice and I remember three and a half years ago when he was torturing me in solidarity and he said, I'm going to put you in Al-Qaeda section, we're going to put you with ISIS, they're going to kill you, I'm going to do these things to you. And I just remember to say to him that, Everything that you do to me, the last day that I see you, I'm going to hug you and I'm gonna, still I'm going to say I love you. You can't push hate in my heart. So when I heard his voice, my eye was banned, I couldn't see, but when I heard his voice, I just grabbed his hand and he was scared. He thought I would just want to, you know, attack him physically or saying something. And then I just get him and hug him. And I saw that he was shaking. I saw his lips, his body was shaking. And when he saw my love, he told me, you can remove your eye band. I remove it. And I said, do you remember three years ago, I said, you, you cannot just, you know, destroy the love that God put me in my heart about the loss. And he said, no, I don't remember. I said, yeah, but I remember that. And now because of that, I forgive you. I love you. And I pray for you. And you are a good man. And he was shocked, you know. 
When we put ourselves in a situation to love people, God's going to open the door. So when I went there in prison, most of my friends were the prisoner that their sentence was just because of spying for America. They were high educated, some of them genius. They helped our country to pass information of nuclear side, genetic bombs and things that Iran government is trying to access. And because they love America, they love me. So I got a good relationship with them and other political prisoners. So it was a good time to use this opportunity to share a gospel with them. And when I just talk about love of God, they were so thirsty and they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And in the first month, I watched that tens of prisoners turned to Christ. And we have a gathering over there, the other prisoners, they call it Evin Church. So we started Evin Church in prison and uh, start giving glory and praying to God. And every day we got communion, you know, with water and bread. So. <laughs> So it was a wonderful time that we went on the bed, you know, we covered it with blanket that the camera can see us, and uh, praying together, and uh, I just tried to memorize Bible to teach them because we didn't have Bible. So it was a wonderful time to see them to turn to Christ. So they're in Evan prison. You were just setting people free with the gospel. Yes, and some and of them still are there. They need our prayer. Yep. Amen. So obviously the only people that are afflicted are not just those who are in prison, but the entire family goes through affliction. Nagme, your children going through incredibly tough moments, just continuing to, to um, be a voice for you and, and, and other brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted and imprisoned. They went through incredible trauma as well. It wasn't that you were in a prison, that whole, your whole family's hope is, is shaken. Your whole life is... A, Tell us a little bit about that, because I know since you've been back, it hasn't been just a, an easy life past this. You, you've come back, and one of the reasons that you are taking a season of sabbatical is because you're, you're focusing in on restoring places that were maybe even broken before you were imprisoned, and you're moving in. And uh, we want to know how we can be praying for you right now, and your as a father, as a husband, as an author. You recently um, decided you're going to begin to tell that story. Um, what, how's, what's going on recently since you've been back, and how can we begin to just focus to pray for your future steps? Last night I shared a post on my Facebook page about staying under pressure. When you go to pressures and try to stay on this pressure to keep your faith and obeying your calling that God gives you, you can see sometimes things is getting separate from you. You know, your freedom and your money, your children, your wife, your time, your young age, you know, and I saw my clothes, you know, I, I saw that things are getting just uh, separating from me, and by watching this process, it's going to be hard for you to stay under this pressure, yeah. and I believe always there is a blessing behind staying under these pressures. Mm. And when you st stay under this pressure until the end, you're going to see at the end of the road, Jesus' hand is just getting your hands and shaking your hand and give you a hug. But you need to finish well. I saw so many Christians when being together in prison, they start in a very good position. And they start churches, they stand for their faith, but when the process gets like a long suffering, it's going to be really hard to be patient and to walk with the Lord. You know, actually, the end of the story is the hard part, hardest part of it, and the end of the story is the, the best part of it. Yeah. It has the more blessing, more result in it. So I'm the same as other people. The last part of my story was the hardest. Still, I got free from prison. But to be honest with you, still I couldn't feel my freedom yet because of the new battle that I went through. Uh, I had, you know, different imagination when I'm going to be free, how it's going to be. But now I'm just seeing that the things that are in my life, it's not in good position actually, especially in my marriage. But I believe God's in it. God is in the middle and in the bottom of everything in our life. And we need just to trust and keep fighting and don't give up and uh, stay under any pressure, and we're going to see that he's going to be glorified. Amen. 
Man, we are uh, heavy-hearted for what's happening right now with um, your marriage, and I know that, um, that there is great hope in knowing that you're not staying, that you're not alone in this. You know, from Pastor Franklin Graham to other uh, just brothers and sisters in Christ, there's an army of people who are standing with you, fighting with you, praying with you. Um, I think where, um, where we're really blessed today in this particular moment of a prayer request is that we have um, Stephen Thomas with us, our senior class president. And I've asked Stephen to come out and pray for you simply because of how this brother resonates at a deeper level than most of us with what, what your kids are going through, Pastor Saeed, and what your sister Zizi is going through, and your mom and dad who are here are going through. Mr. and Mr. Abedini are with us today. And so I've asked him to pray. Stephen, can you just take just one minute and tell, tell folks a little bit of your story and why you really resonate with this, buddy? First of all, I just want to thank God for just protecting you during that time of persecution. Thank you for suffering and just praise God for persecution all over the world. Um, the reason why Pastor David asked me to share this is because growing up, my father was also thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. Didn't know if he was going to come out alive. And uh, it's just that encouragement to give you that even though you were away from your children, you were away from your wife, God had his hands on them. Um, for me, I wouldn't have came to know the Lord unless my father would have been taken from me. Because before I was so reliant on his faith, I was so reliant on everything that he was doing for God, and I tried to emulate that rather than my personal relationship. So it was a blessing for him in that persecution because I wouldn't have been able to experience God. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to see Jesus for myself. So just that encouragement that God's got his hand on your children. Like even though you weren't mm -hmm. there, he was protecting them. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to pray for you and your family. And again, just thank you for everything. So let's pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for this time. Thank you just for your servant here. Thank you um, that you just brought him back and you we're able to let him experience that suffering for your glory, God. And dear Lord, I just thank you for his family. I pray for uh, Nagma. I pray for Jacob. I pray for Rebecca. I pray you just continue to be with them, continue to strengthen them, just to continue to let them know that you're there for them. And I pray you just heal any relationship in that family. I pray that you just take this time um, and just help them to get right back on the start where they were before. And uh, to pray that the judge is stronger than ever. And I just thank you so much for your servant. I thank you for his family, and I thank you for what they've gone through. And I pray that they just use that testimony to further your kingdom and to give you all the glory, God. And I pray for all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. We want to. Um, well, I've asked uh, Pastor Steve Gillum to come. Pastor Steve Gillum, by the way. Uh, just got into town. He's the brand new executive director for the Center for Global Engagement. He was an IMB missionary for years, has traveled the world, church planting, starting Christian education, a uh, top level leader God just brought here to us. Pastor Stephen, first of all, welcome to town. And we're glad God's brought you here to lead us, sir. And um, we love you, brother. And um, I know you, you're very involved in our, in our work around the world. Uh, but uh, we want you to, if you would, I think this brother reminds us today to pray for the work of God in the 1040 window, to pray for the work of God in China, to pray for the work of God in, you know, just the edges of the world, all over the world. And since you're that director, will you just direct us in prayer just for a minute? Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this moment. And even now we come to you with humble hearts. Father, we know that your grace is sufficient, your gospel is powerful. Father, we realize and we know that your gospel isn't for us only as the American church, it's for the global church. And we're asking God for just a renewed awakening of your spirit amongst all peoples in closed or open context, Father, in this world that are hostile to the gospel that are not. And we're asking especially right now for your global church that you would continually give them a fresh vision from Revelation 5-9, from every person, tribe, tongue, and nation who will be bowing before your throne. We ask God that you would give them just a fresh vision every day of that, and especially of the sufficiency of Jesus in all circumstances. So we're asking God that you would mobilize your church from all places of the globe, from Latin America to Africa and East Asia, God, that we would work in humble cohesion 
as the American church, with the global church, because we realize and we know that it isn't about uh, the Western church reaching the rest. It's about reached peoples reaching unreached peoples from every sector and area of society. Oh God, we are asking for lost peoples to come to know you in the darkest places, even so in the 1040 window. And we ask, Father, that you would give us a renewed passion here at Liberty, that students would uh, perhaps here uh, see their career as mission, uh, that many would be given, Father, a renewed focus and a vision to use what they're studying and what they're passionate about and what you're calling to, Father, to be a cross-cultural worker in one of the hardest places in the world that's hostile to the gospel. So help us, God, not to retreat. Help us to advance because of what you have done for us and what you are doing through us. So we pray for the global church, God, that you would sustain your church, your bride, uh, sinful, but your bride that you redeemed by your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Hey, Pastor Said, um, come lead us, brother, in prayer. Would you? We have a, over a hundred million brothers and sisters that are being persecuted for their faith at this moment. Uh, many, many people who've not seen the prayer of, of of being released out of prison come into fruition yet. A lot of kids who don't get to hug their daddy in, in just a little while. You'll get to go and see your kids. You get to go. You have the freedom today to go to Washington D.C. A lot of people who don't have what you've been given, but we want to. We want to stand with them today. We want to wage war for them. Will you pray for the persecuted church? Sure. Let's pray. Lord God, the Father, in Jesus' name we come to you, Lord. As we all saw that we all pray together, chain our hands together, and you brought me here. And I believe that when we pray here, we get united together, chains our hands together, in unity for one purpose, you're going to say amen. We pray for all these countries, Lord, in the Middle East, which their government, they don't let gospel we preach. But I believe in the unity of pray, and I believe in the God that you are, that you can remove everything that is stopping the preaching gospel over there. I pray for million, million in the Middle East, the Muslim actually, that they don't know you and they think they know you, Lord. I pray that you touch their heart, you touch their mind. In the places that no missionary can go there, you can go there and meet them. As you came to my room and meet me face to face, personally, you can do it for all these people, Lord. We pray and we raise up all of them to you, Lord, and we ask your blessing. We ask your God, your Holy Spirit, touch their heart, touch their lives, Lord. Touch the government official, touch the future of this nation, Lord, and you be glorified. We ask your fire, your revival, Lord, upon this nation, upon Upon this government, in Jesus' name, we rebuke every Satan work in there. We rebuke everything it's not from you. In Jesus' name, we rebuke every change, everything that Satan put in, in these people's lives. In Jesus' name, and we open your mighty hands there, and we're gonna see in future millions and millions turn to Christ. You're gonna be glorified. We're gonna see your kingdom increase all around the world, and we accept it in Jesus' name by the power of your yes. name, Lord. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you, um... Um... You just said something to me in Farsi. We know we're just we're just two Iranians standing here in front of a bunch of uh, folks. And he said, uh, "Iran, dare avaz misha." He said, "God is changing Iran." You believe that the kingdom of God is more powerful than any earthly kingdom? Amen, brother. We believe that uh, He'll do it in His timing, right? Uh, our last prayer. All right, let's uh, as we're standing. Let's go before God and, and just uh, a pray a praise to God that you were not released one second before you were supposed to, that God did not delay, 
And so I'm going to ask Chad to lead us in this uh, closing prayer together. And then after we're, we're done out of here, uh, you guys are dismissed. Know that, listen, uh, on Monday, on Monday, we're going to be at the prayer chapel. So in one sense, we're not in here. In another sense, we're not canceled. We have the all prayer for an entire combo hour, right, and a half that we're going to have there if you want to be at the prayer chapel. But let's, uh, let's pray this uh, together, all right? Chad, lead us.